I'm really humbled to have Deb Fleming here today. Deb is the founder and executive producer of Australian Story. It is one of the ABC's finest award-winning programs, beloved by millions of viewers every week. An Australian Story seeks to make Australians in their diversity and individuality more understandable to other Australians. So I'd like you to all make Deb feel welcome on the TEDx Brisbane stage. Please welcome to the stage, Deb Fleming. Thanks very much. Um, one thing that uh, Carl didn't mention in that very lovely introduction um, is something that I'm especially proud of, and that's the fact that Australian Story is made right here in Brisbane. And that does make it uh, quite unique because it is the only primetime national television program in this country uh, that's made outside of uh, Sydney and Melbourne. So that's a, you know, a pretty special achievement. Yay! <laughs> Um, another thing that's not well known is the fact that we're actually part of uh, the ABC's News and Current Affairs division. That means we're in the same stable as uh, the heavy hitters like Late Line and Four Corners. Um, that's something that uh, sometimes surprises people outside the ABC because obviously we're very different to those programs. Um, it still surprises some people inside the ABC. Um, occasionally it really surprises me as well, but there it is. That's because, you know, Australian Story um, is an oddity in so many ways. You know, under any logical analysis, a project like ours should have been doomed from the outset. Um, all we really had when we were starting out was some vague sentiments about what we didn't want to be. We, we didn't... We could see, or we thought we could see in our arrogance, what was wrong with the rest of the media, and we looked at what everyone else was doing, and we thought, well, we just want to do it differently. We just had this perverse determination to do it differently the way everyone else was doing it. So we had a bunch of ideas, a lot of excitement, and uh, really importantly, um, perhaps partly because we were in Brisbane and we were away from our masters in Sydney, we had a lot of freedom to just let our imaginations run wild and get on and do it without people over our shoulder and that was really important as well. Um, just a little bit about my job and what I do. My job's a boring job. I'm the executive producer so I don't go out and meet all these fascinating people. I sit in the office. I hire and fire the staff in colloquial terms. Um, I decide what stories we'll do and I approve the final shape of those programs. I sign off before stuff goes to air. Uh, we put 600 stories to air so far. Um, some of them have broken front page news. Um, some have plunged us into painful controversy. Uh, but uh, the best loved ones have always been about people, famous people, anonymous people, uh, who have persevered and prevailed in the face of often quite bruising adversity constant setbacks. Those are the stories that people keep coming back to. Those are the stories that seem to sort of uh, sustain us all and that we never get tired of hearing about. Um, that interest in uh, adversity has led to us being satirised as Australian Story, award-winning misery. <laughs> um, we, we, can, we can live with that. We have to live with that. People are, are always curious about where the stories come from, um, and the fact is they come from, uh, they come from everywhere. It's, it's very often serendipity. I love serendipity. I'm a great believer in it. One particular favourite of mine was a, a piece we ran last year about a man called Keith Miller, um, and that one got kick-started at, uh, at Heathrow Airport. I was um, hanging around, killing time before that horrible long flight from London back to Brisbane. And I bought a book to read, and the book that I bought was Michael Parkinson's autobiography. And in it, there were a few pages about this guy, Keith Miller, who'd been a, a World War II fighter pilot and a legendary cricketer. He was part of Bradman's Invincibles. Uh, and he just struck me as being, you know, quintessential Aussie, larger than life, a hero to many, but, but you know, a flawed character, a really rich character. His fame had had an almost 
carcinogenic effect on, on his own family. Three of his sons um, became drug addicts and uh, or certainly developed severe drug problems. And, uh, and Miller abandoned his uh, long-suffering wife when she was old and ailing and really needed him. I mean, it was deplorable. And yet his qualities were, were such, his good qualities were such that, that people forgave him and they still adored him and worshipped him. Now, the most significant thing of all was the fact that Miller was dead. I mean, he'd been dead a really long time. Um, but we never accept death as an instant, insurmountable obstacle. Um, <laughs> um, in many ways, you know, it's just a cop-out as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, uh, we were determined somehow to get uh, Miller's story on air. And we did. And if I'm lucky, Ash will play a little clip for you in case you missed it. I was a child. I was about uh, 11 or 12 when I first cast my eyes on Keith Miller. And from that very moment, I was smitten. Uh, you have to imagine post-war England, I mean, post-war, a grey drab thing. And this, this wonderful, handsome, broad-shouldered, dark-haired man with flashing smile. And I, I can't exaggerate too much walked past me at the Yorkshire cricket ground to go out to bat. And in that moment, what he did as he went out to bat, my hero, was he went like that. And I caught a glimpse of a comb in his hand. And many, many years later, 40 odd years later, I was in a lift in Sydney, go for dinner with him. And he went like that. And I said, do you have the same comb? <laughs> and it was. That's by the look of it, you know, she knew 40 years. It was an extraordinary kind of, um, it was an indication that, that my hero wasn't perfect, that he had the vanity inside him. But that didn't stop me worshipping him. Um, Michael Parkinson. Uh, we had to work really hard to get him to do that interview. He initially agreed and then he had to pull out because he'd overcommitted himself. You know, people like that obviously get um, a lot of calls on their time. So we pleaded and begged him to reconsider, and at the 11th hour he did, and, uh, and he came through for us. And uh, we sent him a copy of the DVD after the broadcast, and he wrote a lovely letter saying that it was a hard piece to watch because there was some really confronting and unflattering stuff in the story. Um, but of the overall production, he said that Keith, who hated bullshit, would have appreciated it. Um, so um, that was feedback to treasure, uh, because when you do the story of someone who's not around to defend themselves anymore, um, you're very aware of the responsibilities that you have when you go rummaging around in, in their life. Um, another great favourite that we're going to see a clip of is uh, a piece uh, that you may remember that we did on a young woman who lived um, a very short life, and uh, she's someone about whom no one ever said a bad word. She was the beautiful actress and singer, Belinda Emmett. And we always thought her story was uh, a perfect fit for our program. Um, after her death, it, um, it took a couple of years of, um, of gentle and we hope respectful persistence before her family, and they were the crucial ones, uh, were ready to see her story told. Now, as you would imagine, every day in our office, we're looking at camera tapes coming in from the field, um, we're viewing interview tapes, and we see a lot of very powerful, sensitive, heartfelt material. But we really were stunned the day we received um, a bundle of tapes uh, comprising a video diary that Belinda had been keeping during the course of her illness, something that nobody knew existed, really. It was so unexpected. Nobody realised it was, it was there, and it was such amazing personal stuff to be entrusted with. And, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that we were all sort of weeping as we, you know, sat there and watched it. And, Ash, uh, we've got a couple of minutes of that story, I think. I know personally that, that Rofe feels almost a bit uncomfortable with people always talking about how he was the one who stuck by her. It was Belinda who who went through the illness and Rove was the guy who was in love with her. Belinda began planning that wedding at least four years before it happened, I think. <laughs> she was very excited to become Mrs McManus um, and you know, she constantly was asking, when are you going to ask me the question? When are you going to ask me the question? 
when her dreams came true on that day. It was a beautiful day, absolutely beautiful day. I had never seen her as happy as she was on that day that she walked down the aisle to Mary Rove. Watching their bridal waltz was one of the most amazing uh, experiences of my life because they had the Ben Fold song, The Luckiest. That I It's like the world was kind of cut out when they looked at each other and it was a beautiful thing because you could see that these were two people who were destined to be together. Red Rose has been an absolute gem. It's our two-year anniversary tomorrow and we're all going out for dinner and all that sort of stuff. I'm hoping that we get together to do that. I really want to. But, yeah, um, he's been beautiful. I know it breaks his heart. I know. I know it breaks his heart to watch me. I know he doesn't really want to say. I know he doesn't really want to say any trucker so much, say the wrong thing. I still get goosebumps watching that, I've got to say. Um, I really do. Um, that episode uh, won a Logie. Um, and a couple of months later, the producer of the story, Bridget Donovan, uh, quietly ensured that the uh, trophy was handed to um, Belinda's lovely family for them to keep. Um, Bridget felt the Logie really was for Belinda rather than for us, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, most reporters, I've got to say, would rather surrender their grandmothers than give up a single one of their trophies. Um, so I was really proud, and I still am, of uh, Bridget for doing the right thing and, uh, and, and giving the Logie to the, uh, to the Emmett family. Um, there is a lot of cynicism about the media. Um, two of the other speakers that you're going to hear this afternoon, Nigel Brennan and uh, Chris Sara, have featured on our program. So I'm going to be quaking in my shoes in case they have anything to say about, about us, and I'll be interested to hear if they've got anything at all to say about the, about the media and their experiences of it. Uh, Australian story certainly isn't immune to all the problems and the laziness and the carelessness that uh, can afflict the media, but we do, we do really try to approach things differently. Uh, as I said, when we were starting up, we looked at what other current affairs programs were doing and reversed it, turned it on its head whenever we could. Um, most of us working on the program came from a, a conventional current affairs background. You know, a lot of us had worked on 7.30 report. And one thing that we knew was that people were tired of opinionated journalists. So the first thing we decided to do was get the journalists out of the way. We dropped the reporter voiceovers, the reporter narration, and the reporter questions, and constructed our stories from the interviews that we did with people, um, so that people were effectively telling their own stories in their own words. Uh, the journalism was uh, very much still there, but it was, it was more in the background. Um, and I have to say, of all the things that we did with the show, Getting rid of the pesky reporters was the thing that the audience was absolutely thrilled about, and, and, and they still are, and we hear it all the time. Of <laughs> um, the key things that we wanted to do, we, we wanted a program that was interested not in what people did, but why they did it. We weren't interested in conflict and confrontation for their own sake. We wanted to get under the surface and, uh, and find out what made people tick. Which brings me to the stereotypes. We wanted to ditch the stereotypes. You know, you see it on commercial current affairs particularly. Everybody's either a hero or a villain. It's black or it's white. The rich complexity, the, the shades of grey, the stuff that, that Shakespeare was fascinated by, um, is what we wanted to make our territory because it's so much more real and more interesting. interesting. And uh, last thing, uh, less negativity. Um, so much of conventional news coverage is statuist stuff. It's, 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 it's negative, it's bad news, it makes you despair. We just wanted to um, you know, hold up a little light and add to the spectrum of news coverage. And we figured there was a gap for a program that was interested in the affirmative, in the positive, and could sometimes be quite inspirational without being, we hope, saccharine. Um, I thought... How's my time going? I thought I'd um, wrap up with the story, which um, remains my all-time personal favourite, if I'm absolutely um, 
held down and you pull out my fingernails and I'm absolutely forced to choose. Um, it's the episode in which we finally saw all our dreams um, about the potential of our program really come to fruition. Um, way back working on 7.30 Report here in Brisbane, I'd been aware of um, Broncos coach Wayne Bennett and the fact that he had an incredible and inspiring personal story that had never been told. Um, and we approached him back then in 7.30 days to talk about it, but he always politely declined. When we started Australian Story, we tried again and again. And finally, after something like, you know, a total of about seven years of uh, persisting, he did agree to meet our producers, Pip Quinn and Vanessa Gorman. Um, and frankly, if he hadn't agreed, we'd still be trying now. Um, we honestly never give up. Uh, are you listening, Kylie Minogue and, uh, and Kevin Rudd? <laughs> They're still declining for some reason that I don't understand. <laughs> Um, I, I do still regard that early Wayne Bennett episode, and it was about three or four years into the show that we, we ran that episode. I do regard it as near perfect in terms of our dreams for the program. When Wayne uh, reluctantly agreed to do the story, the Broncos were on top of the tree, everything was going beautifully. But as so often happens, I shouldn't admit this, but, but once we arrived with our annoying cameras, um, it all went really pear-shaped. Um, the Broncos started losing every match, every match. Uh, to his great credit, uh, Wayne didn't renege. <laughs> he didn't pull out, and, uh, and he put up with our cameras in his face throughout the whole horrible, unfolding ordeal. Um, that's my last clip, Ash. Melbourne and Brisbane, of course, led out there by Kevin Walters and no number seven, Alan Langer, today. Now, Jay Walker will go through and score. I realise that, unlike players, that everyone's got to be used by date. And the one criteria that I have for myself is when I lose the enthusiasm for get as hard as it's been the last five or six weeks, I haven't lost it. But you can't do my job unless you're enthusiastic. For it. And he's over. My life has been adversity, but from each disaster I've come back stronger. And even now that we've lost seven games, we're still not the underdogs. I don't fear about what's happening here. I know how to, to battle through it. I know I'll come out the other side of it. I know they'll come out with me. Uh, it's just a matter of when, and we'll be better for it. We'll be stronger people. We'll appreciate winning more than we ever have in the past. Absolutely beautiful shot, that. Uh, that's another one that sort of gives me goosebumps. Um, we called that episode uh, Man for All Seasons. Uh, I thought it was a perfect title, actually, for a man of um, considerable strength, integrity and complexity. I mean, Wayne Bennett is one of the few people that... Uh, I don't get to meet many of the people that appear on, on our show, but I did get to meet Wayne and talk to him a few times. And, uh, you know, he, he, I, I found him to be the real deal, somebody I just admire a lot. Uh, we got heaps of requests to uh, keep repeating that program and we cheerfully kept repeating it. Um, but in the end, his family got absolutely sick of it being replayed over and over and they, they begged us to stop. So, um, so, of course, we did. I hope I'll be forgiven this this afternoon. Um, it's about time I stopped, I think. I've just got a few seconds. But if there is a message that I'd like to leave you with, because I gather that's what I'm supposed to do, um, it's, uh, it's have the dreams, have the ideas, but put the real passion into making it all happen. Um, I do believe in having fun and laughter uh, along the way. I think that's so important. It should be enjoyable. Um, uh, the fun and the laughter will energise you. It will energise your idea. It will energise your team. It will breathe life into, into everything. And a particular bugbear, bugbear of mine, um, whatever you do, just plough past the growing army of gloom merchants, guardians of the orthodox, and general naysayers. Um, don't let the red tape brigade in particular um, beat the life out of you. If it's worth it, it's really simple. Don't give up.
Thank you.